Okay. I want to talk to you. Continue on. I'm, I don't have, I'm not going to have you turn your word just yet. But we've been thinking about the house and God's presence and God dwelling in the house. It's kind of a theme throughout the scripture. I think Exodus 25 would say this. He told the children of Israel, or maybe it was just Moses, to get the children of Israel, build for me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. And that's been a common, that's a common theme from then on. Sometimes it's house, sometimes it's temple, sometimes it's tabernacle, sometimes it's sanctuary. But they're all saying the very same thing. A dwelling place for God, which is then synonymous with just God's presence being in our midst. Okay? God's presence. I mean, it's probably all about God's presence. That's why his name, one of Jesus' names is what? Emmanuel. God with us, right? God with us. And so there's this ongoing theme from temple to temple or from tent to temple and with different expressions and each one revealing and somehow saying something different uh, about what God is wanting and God is doing. And, and so anyway, I want to focus on that a little bit, but I want to focus on a little bit about maybe the priority of it and uh, because there is kind of a mystery to it. I just want you to know that there is a mystery I heard a quote, it was really good. A true mystery is something that after it's revealed still is a mystery, <laughs> okay? Now, for some of you, you're going to pick up on that real easy because you're going, to, you're going to know that there are things that you were really wanting to know and thinking about and you feel like God had revealed it to you and you'll say something like, man, I, I think I'm getting it. And then in just a little bit of time there, you're thinking, Man, I still don't get it because it's just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And that's how it is in, the, in this area of the house, these dwelling places of God. I want to look at a few places today and just kind of say a few things. But how about we just start with this scripture here? David said it. It was repeated for Jesus where it said, zeal, zeal for thy father's house has I think the King James says this, it's pretty potent, eaten me up. Zeal for thy father's house has eaten me up. Now one of the more common translations is consume me. But there is something potent in there about eating me up. Now, can I ask you all something? Have you ever been eaten up with anything? Have you ever, have you ever made even that statement? Man, this is really eating me up. Okay. Well, when you're saying that, the way we're interpreting what you're saying is when you're at bed at night, it keeps you awake. Uh, when you're up, it's, it's affecting you. Now, maybe most of the time we use that phrase, this is eating me up, we're usually putting it in a not negative connotation, okay? It's eating me up. It's, it's usually not a positive thing, but, but take that and just, just put it over into a positive. It's, it's something that's affected me emotionally. It's something that is dominating my thought patterns. It's something that almost becomes an obsession with me. It's eating on me. It's consuming me. And with Jesus, it said, zeal, a passion, like a fire burning, is consuming him. That means that when he wakes up in the morning, he's thinking about God's house. When he goes to bed at night, he's thinking about God's house. He wants to uh, what it would call, uphold the integrity of God's house. He wants to see God's house establish all the different things that it would mean. But whatever it is, I think we could at least conclude this, is that it played an important dominant, or it had a dominant role in Jesus' life right a dominant role now maybe it's not going to be that dominant to you and me because the builder of the house is usually more consumed about the house than the one that just lives in the house and he is the builder of the house but I would have to at least say this if it was such an important part in the desire the mission the 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 emotional um, uh, what I could say if it was just such an important part in Jesus' life, I think we can at least conclude that it should play some role in our life, right? That's all I'm saying. I mean, it may not be, you may not be totally consumed by it, but I think it should have at least a primary role in your life. Your concern about helping 
create or build a dwelling place for God. Okay? Isn't that, could we at least say that? And so my point is, is, David said at least one thing I desired. It's not the only thing he desired, but it was at least one thing he desired is that he would do what? Dwell in God's tabernacle. Okay? So I think we can honestly say that if it was important to David, then it was absolutely important to God. If it was what David's heart wanted, then it must have been what God's heart wanted because David was what? Had a heart after God's heart. So it was important to God, then it was important to David and, and vice versa. And so this idea about making co-laboring with God to help bring a dwelling place. Now, I use those words kind of carefully because when we talk about the dwelling place, it gets that's where some of the mysteries come in, okay? I'm just going to let me just say a couple of things right now. There's the individual dwelling place. That's where the spirit of God dwells within you and me, right? Paul said we're the temple of God, right? That's a dwelling place. That's an individual dwelling place. The scripture also has a corporate dwelling place okay to the church of galatia to the church of ephesus to the church of sardis to the church of thyatira to the to the church of corinth these are places where god desires to dwell in a corporate sense okay then there's what we call like the meta the big the universal dwelling place of god what we saw in hebrews 8 this is the main point we have such a tabernacle in the heavens whose great high priest is jesus christ and that is almost like the compilation or the summation of all the other dwelling places all finding their place and rooted in god's great house that transcends all generations all seasons all times and includes all those that are part of what we would call the ecclesia the called out ones Okay? You know what I'm saying about that. There is a, a, a let, let, me, let me just kind of show you a scripture here that kind of brings it out. Go to Ephesians if you have your Bibles. I want, I want to read this. This kind of brings it out, I believe it or not. Ephesians 2.22. Uh, it's the way it's constructed, but I want you to kind of see what I'm saying here. But, oh, let me just say this when you're going there. Jesus said this. Now, he said, in my father's house are what? many dwelling places okay and that's the idea there's many dwelling places God dwells in the hearts of men God dwells in what we call the church God dwells in the tabernacle in the heaven there are many dwelling places in the father's house and it all makes up the father's house you with me on that but look at this one here just to kind of bring it to you then I want to I want to show something a little different but and he's, uh, Ephesians 2.22, it says this. Well, how about, let's, let me see, I'm, I'm going to go up a little bit. I'm going to go to uh, verse 20. I'm sorry. Every time I say that, Evelyn, years ago, made this comment to me. She says, you always say go to this first, and you always say go back to, okay? She said that to me about 20 years ago, and every time I do it now, I cannot get that out of my head, Evelyn, okay? Thank you for placing that thought in me for the rest of my life, okay? I appreciate that. Could have been something a little more encouraging, but no, it was that. You're, you're confusing me. Okay, okay. so it says, having been built, we're not going to break it all down, but just kind of, let's move there. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, meaning he is the template, he's the pattern, he's, he's what's setting the direction here. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you, Ephesians, also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. First the big building, the whole building, right? But then he focuses on when he says you, he's not saying John, He's speaking to the Ephesians. He's saying to you, Ephesians. In fact, the construct of the word actually is what it's actually saying is that you, here's the big thing growing, the big thing, in whom the whole building is being fitted together, verse 21, a holy temple in the Lord, but in whom you specifically now are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, can I tell you something? 
it's not just that we attend or come together. It's that God wants us to be fitted together. Are you with that? It's not just attending. It's being built. Now, I want you, just for a second, I can't look at every single one of you in the eye, okay? Like, Marilyn, look at you, okay? I can look at you, just focus out. But you have to see that when you show up here on a Sunday morning, some people just attend church, okay? I get it. When I go visit someplace, I'm not being fitted with them. I'm attending, okay? I'm probably not part of the whole dwelling place of God, but I've attended places where I've experienced the dwelling place of God because they've already cultivated it, right? I'm just like a guest in the house, and I'm just I'm get, I'm getting the free lunch of the deal, okay? That's not the same as you seeing yourself as something that is to be fitted together. Now, so I'm, I believe this. This is exactly what I believe. If you've come a few times, I believe you're part of that fitting that we will, what does it say, together for what? For what? A dwelling place of God. I mean, isn't that good? Now look, we're not coming together to have tacos and coffee. That's a cultural thing. We're coming together because God wants to have a dwelling place in Bastrop, Texas. And it's saying you also will be fitted together so that I can come and dwell by the Spirit. So our goal is honestly that we would become a habitation for God's house, right? Celebration. Just like Calvary Baptist, Foundation, River Valley, every group of people is to be a part, a dwelling place for God's presence. And the reason why that is so potent is because that is really about the only way that life transformation is going to happen. We are not a teaching ministry. We want to be a habitation, right? A habitation. And how do we do that? Well, one is, not to get into all biblical stuff, but everything I say, if you want to challenge me, we can challenge you later. Music is part of the wings of that, okay? That's why there's an emphasis of music. Prayer is a part of that. My house should be called what? A house of prayer. Prayer is to be a part of that. The fellowship of the Spirit, you and I coming together, when I say hug a neck, kiss a cheek, I'm not just saying that to be friendly. There's got to be connections that are made with one another. There's got to be. The fellowship. And then God abides in the reading of His Word. You know, Lauren reads a big portion of Isaiah 58. What is the deal with that? Because where God's Word is, God is. Why is that? Because He is the Word. You cannot separate Him from the Word. When the reading of the Word is taking place, it cre creates a habitation for God. Amen? It's not like God says something. He is that. He is that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How do you become a habitation individually? My Word abides in you, right? So the reading of the Word, the prayer, the music is all for the purpose, all for the purpose of God finding a home here which He can be honored in. That's our cry, isn't it? Well, what's it going to look like? Well, I don't know, but I'm, here's what I'm hoping it's going to look like. I'm hoping that when the sick show up, they get healed in God's presence. I'm hoping when people come in that are unsaved, they get saved in God's presence. And I'm hoping that for all those that are already healed and saved, we'll find a place at the altar, on the ground, or whatever, and cry out on behalf of those that need it. Amen. Right? It's not just to be looking around at people. I mean, you got to have a heart for people, Right? When I'm praying, I'm just letting you know a little, just peek in a little bit. It's not no big deal. I'm just, because some people think, well, I don't know. Where, what. I remember one time, here's what I did one time. There was a speaker. He said he's fasted and prayed for three days. So he locked himself up for three days. Well, that impressed me when I was 20 years old. I said, by golly, what does someone say for three days? So I went up to him and I said, hey, can I have an appointment with you? I want to have an appointment with you. He was out of Beaumont. I was in Dallas. He said, yeah, you, I'll be back in Dallas at a certain time. I set this appointment with him. 
And you're going to like this, okay? Man, I couldn't wait to talk to him. I'm serious. I was just, I was excited. You know, you get to see someone that's kind of a hero, you know, kind of. So we finally had our appointment. I'm sitting in the little, little, I don't know where we were sitting. I think it was an apartment or something. And I said, well, you know, I heard you say that you prayed and fasted for three days. I understand what fasting for three days is. That's not very fun. But, hey, what did you do for three days locked up? I want to hear what you had to say. You know what he told me? I, I am serious, and I tell you right here, you're not even going to believe me. Now, listen, I've been waiting for a month to talk to this guy. I mean, I've been salivating to hear what you say for three days. Here's exactly what he said. None of your business. <laughs> he said, that's my time. I don't share that. That's good, isn't it? I didn't pout. <laughs> well, I didn't do that. It even impressed me even more. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's potent. I love that. I love that. That's exciting, okay? That's exciting. I mean, it didn't hurt my feelings. It just made it even more sacred. I was like, yes, you know. But when I'm praying at the altar after I've confessed my 58 sins that I've already had this morning and my impatience and all that, after I get through all that stuff, i got to go through that all the time. That's my neurotic guilt problems. But after that, do you know what it is? It's praying for the people in this building. You. Why is that? Because that's what we want, right? Everyone gets touched by God's power. God's power. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, open our hearts, open our minds. Let them be touched. Let them be undone in your prayer. That's my prayer. So you ever you see me at the altar, you just might as well know it's directed. After the first one minute, it's directed back to what's happening in this room. Amen? Now I want to show you something here. You get that idea. Go with me to Haggai just for a minute. I'm not going to totally break it down. You say, where's Haggai? Well, go to Matthew, go left, three books. Okay? Hey, Matthew left, three books. This morning, Lauren gave me a nightmare, a bad dream I have when I'm standing before people and can't find my text. I mean, she's thumbing through that Bible back and forth. I, mean, it was like a, it was, I have that dream all the time. i got to be honest with you. I'm standing in the pulpit. I cannot find the scripture for the life of me. I'm just, <laughs> it never goes away. And sometimes in my pajamas. Okay, but it, that, that feeling of not being able to find your text, your scripture text, you know, when you're trying to preach. Okay. Okay, here's, shift gears with me just for a second. We're going to cover two, two thoughts. Because I started out with this. God's house has to hold an important, or has to have an important place in our heart. And I'm glad it's you this morning that it's here because by and large, most people that are in the house today are people that have been in the house for a long time or in other houses, okay? So it works out really good that it's who's here today. Because honestly, I'm counting, and I mean, when I'm saying I, I only can speak for myself, but I'm counting on you to be allowed to be fitted together, to find your place in this world, so that we can enjoy God's presence here, okay? That's what I'm counting on. So, But when God's house is not a priority, and we can kind of just take it or leave it, or God's presence, let's just say God's presence. Whenever I say God's house, you might as well just know what you're going to say through the, the, the line of reasoning, God's presence. When God's presence is not a priority in our life, we get trapped as individuals in the cycle of futility. Let me explain this now. Go with me to Haggai. The temple at this time has been decimated, and the people are returning back from their captivity. And so they've been brought back from their captivity, and they've been rebuilding their houses. They've been rebuilding their life. They've been rebuilding their towns, probably their cities. 
But what they haven't really given much concern to is what we call the ruins of the temple because the temple of Solomon had been completely, utterly, almost destroyed. And in verse 5, God says this. I'm sorry, in verse 2. Evelyn, you've cursed me. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying this. This people says... The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Very simply, in a modern day translation, we just say this, man, I really just don't have time for that. Can I tell you something? For someone that doesn't want to do something, every excuse is your obstacle. Every excuse is an obstacle. When you don't want to do it, I remember, this must have been an angel that said this to me, because you know how sometimes people just say something so direct to you, kind of like what uh, this, that fella told me what, you know, a little bit earlier, but I worked for a sporting goods store years ago when I was 19 years old, and I worked in a camping department, and I'm sitting there at the tents and the sleeping bags with some a guy, and he's talking about you know, going camping up into the mountains. I was living in Arizona, so it was a big deal, and he's buying, he's buying stuff for that. Okay? And here's what I said to him. I said, oh my gosh, that sounds so good. I wish I could do that. And what's weird is most people are not this abrupt with you, especially when you don't even know who they are. And he just very clearly said, no, you don't. And it caught me off guard. What do you mean, no, I don't? I would love to go to the great Sierras, the high Sierras, blah. He said, no, you don't. And I said, well, because it took me so off guard, I, said, I think I might have said, well, what do you mean? He said, because you do what you want to do and if you really wanted to do it you'd be doing it and that was a word that he spoke now maybe that was an angel there just to make sure that, that can I want to tell you something for the since that was 19 years old I have carried that with me ever since he said it and every time I start making excuses it always puts me in check always puts me in check it's like what Chester Webb used to say all the time. He said, an excuse only pacifies the one giving it. Right? I don't care if you're late for your job or whatever. The boss never wants to hear, oh, I was caught in this, I was up. You know what? That only pacifies you. So you do the things that are important to you. So it's just best, we can't be this honest with people, but when someone asks you to do something, instead of making some lame excuse or letting every excuse become your reason of not doing it, you just need to be honest with yourself and say, I just don't want to do it. And that's what they were basically saying. It is not the time, we're just too busy. Now, here's what happens though. But God questions them a little bit. He said, yeah, but it seems to be time for you yourselves to dwell in your own paneled houses while this temple lies in ruins. So he's basically, God challenges him and said, look, you've got plenty of time to do what you want to do for yourself. Plenty of time for that. Your hobbies, your dreams, your goals, your ambitions, all the things that make your life comfortable and all the things that make your life good you seem to find plenty of time for that. That's what he's saying. And then he comes back, and he says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, you need to consider your ways. Consider your ways. And here's what he says. You've sown much, you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, you're not warm enough. You earn wages, but it's like you earn wages with holes put in it. Now, that's all I'm going to say in this area here as far as in Haggai. It's a beautiful book. You ought to go and read it. But let me just say it this way. When God's presence, which is represented in God's house, is not a priority in your life, you get trapped in the cycle, now hear this, of never enough. Never enough. There's never enough. In the wilderness, it was just enough, but in God's promises, it's more than enough, right? 
But here, it's never enough. No matter how much you want it, you can never quite achieve it. You're always falling just short of it. And what that is in the book of, of Ecclesiastes is it's part of the thing that creates the cycle of futility. Okay, it's a cycle of futility. When, when Solomon said this, meaningless is everything, vanity is everything, one of the things that made him feel that way was that the eye is never satisfied with seeing and the ear is never satisfied with hearing. In other words, under the sun, life under the sun, always leaves you wanting john said it this way the world is passing away right have you ever been in that of course you have and even if you feel like you find satisfaction then the second aspect of futility is that nothing lasts so whatever you do feel is very short-lived okay Amen? Something is just, it's never enough. It's, see, the, with younger people, you know, 20s and 30s, see, they're, many of them are still living under the illusion, and which is eventually be delusion, that they feel like if they could just get their family right, get the right house, get the right job, get the right this, get the right pay, then they'll be happy. But what is usually called a midlife crisis is really just the realization that the things that you thought were going to make you happy, that if you just had this salary, you just had this size house, this type of situation, this kind of family, that things would be good. But what you find out is you're still not happy because it's never enough. You get a new car, in six months you're tired of it anyway. You get a new phone, in six months you're tired of it anyway. You think, well, this person will make me happy. Well, I'm going to tell you something. After a while, it just becomes some sacrifice and some effort, isn't it? It's never enough. Why do you think people are always, you, you know, you see people that have a lot of money, like the guy with Amazon now, uh, Bezos. He's a guy worth $140 billion. You're thinking, man, why don't you just chill out? Because I can tell you something. It's never enough. It's never enough. And what is the answer to it, though? Hey, guys, saying that only God, His presence, is what's going to fill the vacuum that the world just can't fill. And even though you're struggling and you're working harder, you never can quite get ahead because your priorities and your values are wrong. Now, what's interesting now, David said. What did he say? That I may dwell in your house forever and ever. But what did he say before that? My cup runneth over. See, David understood that it was in God's house, in God's presence, that there was not never enough, but it was fullness of joy. More than enough, right? With Jesus, who became the, the very tabernacle and, and temple on the earth, Jesus illustrates this fact that in him it's always more than enough when they ran out of wine he gave them more than enough not just enough but the world left them empty we've run out we've run out with peter and james or peter and john whoever was in the boat they labored all night and came up empty never enough Jesus tells them to go further, go deeper. They come up with more than enough, right? Their necks were breaking. And can I tell you something? That's what fullness actually means, by the way. Crammed full. And it was John that said, what? The Word, hear this, became flesh and tabernacled among us and all of us have benefited from his fullness. Right? His fullness. So the priority here is this. If you're just spinning your wheels and you're like Mick Jagger who emphasizes 
four times, not even a verily, verily, verily. He actually goes to the fourth degree and says, no, 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 no. I can't get no satisfaction. And I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and I've tried. Heck no. <laughs> right? <laughs> Now, see, you think, some people think, though, some people think this. Yeah, but if I had what Mick Jagger had, I would be satisfied. See, we don't even believe the people who've already been where we think we should go sometimes. We don't even believe them when they say they're not happy. Because we think we're going to be happy. Because, see, you've never had that much. So you're always thinking a little more will make you happy. But, see, they had a lot more, and it still left them with a never enough. So much so that even when Solomon said, I built houses, I built gardens, I did this, I did this, he wakes up, I think, in Ecclesiastes 5 and says what? I hate life. I hate life. Because he's trapped in this cycle of futility. And so what's God saying the answer is? Consider your ways. He says, this is the answer. You rebuild my house, and I'll rebuild your life. That's what he told. It's what he told Haggai. And he said, I'm going to do more than that. He said, I'm going to actually start giving you harvest before the seed is even sown into the ground. I'm going to bless you so abundantly that even though the seed is still in the barn, you're going to have harvest unbelievable. Why? Because you're going to focus on rebuilding my house. Right? David wanted to build the house. You know that at the end of the story. He said, I want to build a house. God said, you're not building a house. This is interesting. He told David, he said, have I ever even asked for a house? Have I even asked for a house? But David didn't interpret that as meaning God didn't care about houses. See, that's what we would interpret as. Well, I guess we don't care about houses. Let's just go meet in the field again, okay? No, that's not what David, David just realized that was about him not building a house. But he knew Solomon was going to build the house, and so he started doing everything he could to help Solomon build a house. Went and got everything for Solomon. But here's what, here's what God said. David because you wanted to build my house, though, I'm going to build your house, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. But the priority was what? Zeal for thy father's house has consumed me. Are you with me? Of his fullness we have all received why do we want god's presence here church why do we want to come together and the different giftings be used to help cultivate a, a place an atmosphere why is all of that because i gotta be honest with you i feel like it's the only hope for a lost generation i do i do i'm gonna tell you something they don't even care what you have to say anymore did you know that everything is questioned now i mean it's almost like it's like, even though the preaching of the word is, is, is potent and different things like that, the power of God and the salvation, I get it, but I'm going to tell you something. We have a generation that's hard of hearing. We have a generation that doesn't care. I'm not talking about just 20s and 30s. I'm just talking about a generation. Everybody's living today. And there's, 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 a, there's a thousand, there's 2,000, there's 4,000 different ideologies out there. Who would even know what's right? I'm going to tell you how they're going to know what's right. Because when God is in the house, things change. I'm just telling you. That's what it is. Let God be here. So what is our job? What is our job then? When you show up, we're not asking you, we're hoping you attend, but our job is to do what? When you come here, you say, what can I do? What can I do? Well, here's what you can do. First, you can pray because that is what the house is. The, the, the common atmosphere is my house shall be called what? A house of prayer. Prayer is important in God's house. It is. You can sing. You can shout. You can dance. You can do whatever you want because that's what God says he likes anyway, right? So everybody bare minimally can pray. You can look around the room and, and ask God to speak to you about someone in this room, in this house. And maybe God will lead you to pray for someone over there, to prophesy over someone. All I'm saying is, you don't need me to get you to do everything. You know what I'm saying? It's not my responsibility to figure out everybody's place in the temple of God. 
you find a place. Amen? Find a place. My dad used to tell me this. Never, this is what he used to tell me. It was good, good wisdom when you get a job. Don't ever stand around. Act like you're doing something. That's what he told me. That was like the number one, the number one principle when I got a job at a restaurant. He said, don't ever just stand around. You know what I'm saying? So every time I had nothing to do, I'd just find a rag and act like I'm wiping a table. I'm serious. That's what you do, right? Isn't that right? You want employees not just standing around. Doggone, get a shovel, clean the truck, take, put the trash out. Don't sit there and let me have to tell you everything you got to do. Oh, and by the way, can you clean the truck out now that you've been standing around for 30 minutes? No, you don't want that. A, a good employee is someone who makes himself busy. Right? That's what a good employee does. Well, let me tell you something. That's what a good Christian does, too, when you come in the house. My gosh, pick up a piece of paper off the floor. Do something. That's all I'm saying. Now, I want to end with this. I want to end with this thought. When the word, this is, this may liberate a couple of you. When the word became flesh, he, what, what, how do we say it? Did I write this down? Okay. There was a marriage. Listen to this now. This is important because some of you are confused on that. I'm just telling you, I, I hear it all the time. There was a marriage between what I'm going to call the spiritual and the material. A marriage took place. Jesus didn't just come down and dwell in a spirit form. He married heaven and earth together. Okay, That's what he did. And it was in his body, according to Ephesians, that marriage between the spiritual and the material, the fullness of God dwelt not just in the spiritual and never just in the material but when there was a marriage of the two God's fullness dwelt are you with me on this so here is my point there will always be a material element in building God's house there has to be has to be I even thought it through this morning one more time after 50 times let's just say you say buildings are non-essential we don't need that we don't need all that then let's just go meet in a field let's go meet in a field well i want to tell you something somebody's gonna have to mow the field right doggone it that's our first offering who is gonna mow the field <laughs> right who's gonna mow the field before you know it someone don't want to sit on dirt someone's buying chairs who's gonna pay for those chairs I want to tell you something. The evolution will always lead us to a place that we can meet together, and that is part of the house of God. Because when the Word became flesh, the two, what they call a hypostatic union. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how hard you try, you can never be 100% spiritual because that's what we are human beings we're not angels amen but i'm gonna tell you something it's much better to be a human being than an angel it is they only long to look into these things we get to encounter them right we are the dwelling place of god not angels not the 24 the creatures and the many-eyed creatures around heaven's throne only man who was made lower than the angels but at some point he'll be crowned with glory and honor that is the destiny of man right the dwelling place the habitation of god himself who wants to be an angel right no offense if they're in the house okay but i'm gonna tell you something even they know that they have, do not have the benefit of being created in the very image of Christ. Amen? You know what? God wanted to send an angel to, with Moses. Do you remember the honor of that tag? He did. Uh, so I'll send an angel with you. You go on. Moses said, I don't want an angel. He said, unless you go, I'm not going. It was God's presence that Moses wanted, not an angel. 
Some people read angel books. I'll tell you something. Read Jesus books. Amen? They're there. They're for you. Okay. Are you with me? Everybody does their part. I remember, I'll end with this little story about everybody does their part. I think it was a promise keeper deal or something. I don't know. We were like 25 guys. We were in Houston, and we went to breakfast together. But the, the restaurant didn't want us to, uh, they wouldn't put it on separate tickets. I hate that. Okay. So I said, okay, I'll collect the money. So people throwing their fives at me, throwing this here, here's some, here's some. So I get to the cash register, and lo and behold, I mean, everybody's out. All the men have gone. Everybody's excited. I'm sitting at the cash register counting it out. I'm $80 short. Well, I know my meal didn't cost 80 bucks. I mean, I just had two eggs and a toast and stuff, the American breakfast or something, you know what I'm saying? Well, all the guys, they're all out and back in the van. I mean, I, mean, I was already broke already anyway, you know. I mean, what I was really hoping is more would come in so I wouldn't have to pay, that I would get the benefit of being the carrier of the money, right? But that's not the way it worked. I, I got an $80 bill. Now, did, did I go to the van and say, hey, guys, someone didn't divvy up enough. I didn't do that. But what if I did? What if I went back and I said, hey, guys, I want you to know something. Uh, someone either didn't figure taxes, tips, and title in this thing because uh, there's several dollars missing here. But what if I said that? And what if someone would have said from the back seat, said, you know what? Is that what this is all about? This is, just, is that what it's all about, about money here? I thought we were supposed to have a good time together as men. Now you've made it about money. I can see why you've even invited me here. You, that's all you want is my money. What would you think? One, you know, as a parent, you know what the great thing is? When your parent kids get older, I can't say i got to be careful in front of Josh. But isn't it a good feeling when your kid finally says they'll bring something for dinner? I mean, they're 45, they still haven't act, you know, asked for it. You, know, you brought them over for dinner, and they still haven't said, hey, we'll bring something. I mean, it, I want to tell you something. As a parent, it's almost like you've entered in the kingdom when you take your kids out to dinner, and they act like they want to pay for their share. <laughs> I remember when Summer said that to me. She said, hey, Dad, I'll get mine. I'm like, <laughs> you're going to get you. You know, as a dad, I'll just say, no, it's okay, honey. I'm going to get it. But I want to tell you something. In my heart, I'm thinking, finally, you have moved from a kid to an adult because you're not expecting me to carry the load the rest of your life. Right? Well, that's how it is in the church. We say something like, hey, guys, Blue Bonnet, Aqua, uh, the people that clean our carpets, uh, the taco place hasn't decided yet to give it all to us for nothing. So I just want you to know, if you come in here and the electricity's on, once a month that bill's due. Now, if you want to be a kid about it and say, I th is this all that is about? Here's about money for the house? Well, then that's just being a kid, right? Put away childish things. I didn't know I had to tell you that we still pay for stuff around here, okay? I th maybe some people still think it's free. I guess y'all think it's free. I guess you think Blue Bonnet has bought into the vision of celebration and said, guys, just go on. It's all for nothing. But I want to tell you something. When it comes to that time, if you're not participating, guess what? Someone over here is paying $80 for their breakfast. <laughs> Someone's paying 80 bucks for that breakfast. Because someone chose not to take adult responsibilities and bring something to the meal. <laughs> And that's what we decide with our kids when they move into adulthood is that they decide that they're going to come and contribute to this thing Versus just always being takers, right? But one of, one of dad told me, he said, hey, John, can you at least bring us out? Oh, I get it. It's all about food, isn't it? You, you, I see what you're trying to do. You're just trying to get me to bring, about my, bring food. I thought this was about fellowship and love and, and Jesus. I mean, see how stupid that sounds? But I can tell you something. I hear that almost every single week. I hear someone say, all they care about is my money. No, all we care about is you grow up and start taking responsibility in the house. Because that's what we are, right? That's what I said about the material. This is a house. And it will always be married to the spiritual. The material and the spiritual will always be married. But it's in that, trust me, church, it was that that the fullness of God dwelt. Are you with me?